Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I think that this is going to be um, an interesting presentation. I think for me, this is a really important presentation. Um, and the reason is that this is really sort of like my third evolution in understanding ADHD. So back when I started 20 years ago as a psychologist working with folks with ADHD, I understood ADHD really just as I don't know, like that list of symptoms that, that we're all familiar with. So gets distracted, disorganized, whatever, all that standard stuff that everybody is so familiar with. Um, my second evolution then was once I understood the executive functions and all of a sudden I was like, wow, this really makes a big difference in terms of how I understand ADHD. Um, now this latest evolution is ADHD really kind of in relation to time. And that is what we're going to be talking about is how does ADHD impact somebody's relationship to time in terms of seeing time, feeling time, getting tasks done in relation to time. So Russell Barkley, um, a, a brilliant man of many excellent quotes, has a quote here that I use where he says, time is the ultimate yet nearly invisible disability afflicting those with ADHD. So in other words, ADHD is really, I used to say ADHD is all about executive functions. Now what I say is ADHD is all about time. And as we spend the next hour or so, hopefully you'll get a sense of kind of why that is and all the many ways that it is. And that helps you sort of put the pieces together and understand some of what you're seeing either in your life your kid's life, your partners, your clients, your students, whatever it is that brings you to this webinar. So let's begin with just some sort of basics about the sense of time. So um, probably most people listening have heard of, at least heard the words executive function. And um, sense of time is one of those executive functions. There are a number of other executive functions like working memory and um, you know, others that we're going to talk about, but, um, but sense of time is one of those executive functions. And it basically it involves this sort of like dynamic, fluid shifting of kind of mental resources and energy and time among all the various tasks that we could be doing at any given moment, all the various goals and priorities and interests that we have. Um, as you progress through life, from childhood to adolescence to adulthood, um, being good at time management becomes increasingly important. And as with any other human ability, it sort of exists on a bit of a bell curve in the sense that some people have a really great sense of time. Their internal clock ticks really loudly. They're aware of time. They use it well. They know how to manage it. And then there are those for a lot of different reasons potentially who they just don't hear and feel time in the same sort of way like time ticks a little bit more softly um so fortunately though even if your internal sense of time is not very strong we can supplement those internal abilities with plenty of external systems tools and strategies and that's part of what we're going to be talking about here today is trying to take in the theory and the science and applying it into everyday real life but just to set the stage a little bit more, you know, often we talk about time management as if it's like one thing, but really time management is a lot of different things. There's a lot of sub abilities under the umbrella of time management. So um, here is not at all a complete list, but here is something of a list just to give you kind of a flavor of what we're talking about. So on the one hand, there's elements of sort of setting priorities among competing options. So you got all these different things to do, different time. They're going to take different amounts of time. They have different deadlines. What do I do now? What do I do later? Et cetera, et cetera. So figuring out that plan amongst all these different competing options. Um, their ability to pr predict how long an activity takes. And some people are really good. And some people tend to really underestimate. And some people tend to really overestimate. It's the ability to sequence various activities. So for example, if I need to call the bank and I need to call my friend, well, my friend's probably going to be available tonight. The bank is not. So maybe I call the bank first. Um, it's the ability to monitor the passage of time during activities, particularly interesting activities. So that 
hyper focus of getting locked into an activity and not noticing time going by. Um, there's also the ability of noticing the approach and then ultimately the arrival of a specific time. So, ooh, I got to leave at 3.15 today. What time is it now? How much do I have? Okay, what about now? Okay, what about now? And then finally, the ability to readjust priorities and activities in relation to time as the circumstances change. Uh-oh, I spent too long on that. Or, oh no, the printer is not working. Now what do I do? What do I change? What do I drop? How do I sort of shift my approach here? Now, often when I talk to people, talk to clients in my office or whoever, um, and we, you know, they sort of say like, oh yeah, I struggle with time management or my kid struggles with time management. You know, often what seems like a time management problem is, can be a little bit more fundamentally a distraction management problem. And the reason is this, you can have a great plan for how you're going to spend your day. But if you get distracted and pulled off onto other things, then that plan goes out the window as soon as your attention goes somewhere it's not supposed to. So managing time well often begins or incorporates managing distractions well. And of course, a lot of what we do with ADHD is about managing the external environment. How do we make the stuff we want to pay attention to stand out more? How do we make the distractions stand out less? And, you know, the hyper-focus of ADHD, that thing of getting locked in, particularly in something enjoyable, in losing track of time, it, on the surface, it looks like really good attention, but in reality, what it is, is a, a lack of awareness of time passing. So one way of thinking about it is getting kind of distracted, in quotes, by the current task and forgetting to monitor time, forgetting what else is coming. Which brings us then to one of the other work, uh, one of the other executive functions, which is working memory. And we use working memory basically to store what we're paying attention to. And when we're holding something in working memory, we are then also resisting having that task get bumped out by something else. So when you're walking from one room to the next and saying like, oh, I need to go do this, and then you see something else and you get distracted and pulled off, that's what's happened is, is the distraction, I say, it kind of hijacked your working memory, that the distraction knocked out the plan that you walked into the room with. Ultimately, the executive functions and time management here in particular is really about the future, that we use time management not necessarily to achieve the goals of the present, but to achieve the goals of the future. So if something takes just a few seconds and you can just do it and done, it doesn't require time management. You just sort of finish it and there's no, there's hardly any time there to manage, so to speak. Unfortunately, most of life, and especially as you, you know, move out of the toddler years, most of life involves a lot of the future. Like it's all about the future and whether it's school, doing homework today so you can get a good grade at the end of the marking period, whether it's about work, of you know, planning ahead so you have something to eat for dinner, planning ahead for retirement, you know, which could be 50 years down the road or 40 years down the road. It's really about preparing for the future and maximizing the future, not just what's going to be most interesting in the present. And often working towards the future means resisting what's happening in the present. So in order then to think about the future, in order to act towards the future, we need to first kind of disconnect from the stimuli or the goals or the interests that are, are in our immediate circumstances in the present. So, you know, like just a simplistic example of this is here I am, I should be doing my math homework. Ooh, that girl I'm kind of hot on, she just texted me, right? So in order to say, no, math is more important, put the phone away, don't look at it, that's not the thing to be paying attention to right now. Um, in order to work towards that future good math grade, I need to resist the temptation of the present moment. And this is, this is the stuff that Russell Barkley talks about in his executive function theory of ADHD when he talks about response inhibition. So in other words, ho inhibiting, holding back a response to whatever is going on in the immediate moment 
so that the executive functions can kick in and do their thing. So time management then, one of the ways of thinking about it is time management involves internal control over our behavior and what we do, not simply external or environmental control. So when we get pulled by the things around us in the moment, when we get distracted, when we lose track of time, it's because the environment is determining too much what we do. And this creates a question then, does time management serve free will? Or does free will give us the ability to manage time? Um, and I definitely did not get a good enough grade in philosophy first semester freshman year in 1988 to answer that question. So um, I'll defer to greater minds on that. But nonetheless, I think it's kind of an interesting question to think about if you like really want to nerd out on time management stuff. So this then brings us to our first of two kind of big, really important key concepts. And the first one here is what's called time horizon. So <clears throat> if you think about like hori the horizon in real life, like let's say you're standing on the beach and you're looking out across the water out to the horizon. If there's a ship way, way, way out there and it's coming towards you, at a certain point in time, it will come close enough sort of over the horizon that you can actually begin to see it. And you go, ha ha, there's that ship. Um, and then the closer it gets, the bigger it gets, and the more you may begin to do something in relation to the arrival of this ship. Um, of course, depending if there are friends or enemies on that ship. So time horizon is sort of like that, except instead of physical space, it's the space of time. So the simplest way to sort of explain this is, if today is Monday, and you have a test on Friday, or let's say, you know, a big sales meeting pitch on Friday, if you're a kid or an adult, um, how much do you see that Friday deadline here on Monday? Um, if you're 10, Friday doesn't really exist that much. You don't really see it that clearly on Monday. Where you see Friday is like maybe Wednesday, probably Thursday. Um, if you're 40, you may see Friday a whole lot earlier. So the older we get, the further out in time we can sort of see and be motivated to do something about it. And we'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, now, of course, the more interesting something is, the more likely you are to be motivated. So it's not just about time alone. It's about time, but also how interesting something is. So if something is really appealing, you might get going. If your mom is hassling you on Monday about that stupid test on Friday, you might get going. Not because you care about the test, but because mom is giving you a hard time about it. So you are motivated, but again, it's not about Friday. It's about mom right now in your face. Or it's about you can't watch TV until you finish your homework. So Barclay also talks about, he kind of coined this term future myopia, or at least maybe he didn't coin it, but that's where I first saw it. Um, <clears throat> to future myopia, meaning trouble seeing the future, which leads to this idea that often kind of gets quoted, which is, you know, it's a little bit tongue in cheek, but there's kind of a seed of truth in it that for folks with ADHD, there are two times. There's now, and then there's not now. And pretty much everything into the future becomes not now. Now, obviously, that's like a huge oversimplification, and it's not actually like that. But what it does sort of the deeper truth that it kind of gets to is the idea that folks with ADHD have a shorter time horizon for their age. So, you know, a 10 year old will have a shorter time horizon than a 15 year old, which will have a shorter time horizon than a 20 or a 30 year old. So in other words, the older you get, conceivably, generally speaking, group averages, you tend to think further into the future. So, what happens then for folks with ADHD is that they don't plan into the future as consistently because they don't see the future and they're not sort of motivated to be kind of spurred to action until the deadline becomes closer to the now. So this is that old thing of like, you know, again, the big test on Friday, on Monday, mm, I don't know. Wait, 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 do we, we, I think we have, do we have a test on Monday? I don't know. I don't remember. No, I don't think we do. Tuesday, 
Mm, I don't know, not much different. Wednesday, um, I think someone in class said something about a test. I'm not really sure. Thursday night, oh my God, now I realize, now I remember I have a test. So it creates a situation where there's sort of like, and this is a little bit of an overstatement, but there's sort of like apathetic procrastination followed by suddenly frantic scrambling at the last minute. And the problem is, no matter how terrible this Thursday night is, next Monday does not work out any differently. Because again, next Monday, they don't feel next Friday's test any more strongly. They don't see it any more clearly. So now the thing of uh, the thing then for all of us is that life involves continuous choices that at any given moment, there's lots of different things that you can do. And some of them are fun and some of them are important and some of them are just sort of annoying and stupid and some of them are just entertaining and stupid and some of them are like super important, but not really that clear. So, you know, like, for example, if I think about like, well, what do I want to do on Saturday? I could say, well, you know, I should really spend more time with my son. Maybe we'll go, you know, maybe we'll play some ping pong. Maybe we'll go for a walk. I might think like, you know, the dog, we should really take him out. But then again, you know, the basement's kind of a wreck. We should really kind of get something on that. And, you know, I should really go to the gym as well now that I think about it. You know, if we cooked a bunch of food for the week, that would really kind of, right? So like any of us can think of 50 things that we could be doing in any given moment. Um, it's the executive functions then that allow us to sort of sort through all these possibilities and figure out what's the best combination of compromises that will create, hopefully, a better future for ourselves and for the people that we care about. So there's always kind of a cost benefit between these pursuing this goal versus that one versus the other one. And the cost benefit is influenced by time horizon, which then brings us to our second of two really important concepts, which is um, something called temporal discounting, which is a term from economics and temporal in this case means time. And basically, the way it works is this. Um, the further out a potential reward or a potential punishment is, the less we feel it now. So the kid on Monday sitting there thinking about the test on Friday, is not, he's not really feeling like, how bad would it be if I bombed that test? Or alternatively, how awesome would it be? How great will the weekend be? What cool stuff will I get to be able to do if I get a good grade? How happy will mom and dad be with me? Um, now, by Thursday night or Friday afternoon after the test, now they may feel it. So, um, so on the one hand, all of us feel the present much more strongly than the future. So this is why people are terrible at saving for retirement. This is why people, I don't know, go to McDonald's and then eat too much. And then afterwards, they're like, ugh. That was disgusting. Why did I do that? Um, because in the moment, in the present, you're not thinking about, I'm going to feel like barfing if I eat all of those French fries. What you think about is, these French fries are so delicious, give me more of them. So the challenge then for all of us, every human in the world, is to balance the what's good for us in the present moment and what's good for us in the future. And we're all tempted to sort of maximize the present at the cost of the future. So it could be these French fries are delicious, I'm going to keep eating them. Um, so I'm going to maximize my pleasure. Or it could be I'm going to minimize my pain. So I really don't feel like studying. I hate this class. It makes me feel stupid. It's really boring. La, 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 la. I'm not going to deal with it. Right. So, um, so in either more pleasure, less pain in the present, except it causes more, more pain and less pleasure in the future. So um, if anybody knows the famous kind of marshmallow experiment, this is exactly what it's tapping into. So if you look at marshmallow experiment on YouTube, basically it's this, an experimenter sits down, you know, this series of very cute, like four and five year olds or different ages, whatever, and says, I will give you one mar marshmallow right now. You are more than welcome to eat it. Or if you can wait a minute, I'm going to go down the hall and I'm going to get a second marshmallow. And if you haven't eaten the first one, I'm going to give you a second one. You'll have two. That sounds great. Two marshmallows, mathematically speaking, is definitely more than one. And yet, a lot of the kids scarf down the first marshmallow. So they are losing out. 
And yet, I mean, it's easy to look at it as adults and say, why would they do that? And yet any of us, when we stay up too late, we then pay the price tomorrow, right? We are losing the marshmallow experiment when we stay up too late. We're losing the marshmallow experiment when we eat too many French fries, when we don't prepare for the meeting that we should, when we you know, do something to make the present better and then ignore the cost in the future. This is then especially true for folks with ADHD, is that they're more likely to choose the options that have more immediate payoffs. So playing Xbox on Monday night is definitely a much more fun way, a better, more enjoyable way to spend Monday night than studying for a Friday test, except that then they pay the price somehow or other later. So folks with ADHD then really feel the present much more strongly than they feel the future, which therefore creates a situation, it's kind of an unfair fight, like the future cannot win over the present, which is why then folks with ADHD struggle to sacrifice in the present in order to create that better future for themselves until finally and suddenly the future has become the present. Oh my God, I have that test next period. So on the one hand, if you don't really understand ADHD, it's easy to get, and if you're a bit kind of critical and judgmental, it's easy to look on this and really be kind of judgy about it. Because why would you take the smaller payoff? Why would you take one marshmallow when there are two a minute or two away? Definitely wait for the second one. Um, and yet, if you sort of think about it in this, in terms of like time horizon, in terms of temporal discounting, those with ADHD are actually making reasonable decisions based on what they see and based on how they feel in that moment. So they're reasonable, they're just sort of perhaps ill-fated in the sense that they don't ultimately serve their future as well as they might hope. And unfortunately, and this is a thing I don't need to say because if you're on this call, you know this, past experience doesn't change what happens next time. Because in the next time, despite whatever self-blame or recrimination, despite whatever promises, it doesn't necessarily change it. And by the way, neither do guilt-inducing lectures. So no matter how terrible you feel on Friday afternoon, next Monday, it doesn't have enough of an impact to change it. If it did, you wouldn't be on this webinar. <clears throat> so if you are too absorbed in the rewards and punishments of the moment, if you're too stuck on the stimuli around you right now, it makes it harder to act to not only think about the future, um, which involves the executive function known as forethought, um, but it also involves the ability to access the past or the executive function that, that in my writing I call hindsight, which is sort of the ability to look back and say, okay, here we are Monday night, um, I you know, had a few tests from this teacher. How bad are the tests? How hard are they? How am I doing? How much? How well do I know the material? How have I done on the homework? Let me think about what I need to do, right? So folks with ADHD can do this if they're prompted to, but in the moment they tend not to do it, and it's and that's because of that insufficient response inhibition that they don't it's not like they sit there and really sort of game it out and they think about okay monday night eh, do it don't do it what do i think it's sort of like it doesn't even happen like they don't spend enough time to really sort of pause and think through what it is that they might do <clears throat> so this then brings us to yet another russell barkley quote if you're going to talk about adhd and definitely anything related to executive functions um russell barkley is a guy you want to be quoting a lot um, so he says, time and the future are the enemies of people with ADHD when it comes to task accomplishment and performance towards a goal. And it just sort of reminds me, I had some client, I don't know, 10 years ago or something, I don't even remember when, but he had this awesome line where he had a coworker who said to him very astutely, um, you know, I can ask you to do anything right now, biggest, hairiest, worst project. If I ask you, can you do this thing right now? and you'll do an awesome job on it. But anything I ask you to do later, like it's kind of a crapshoot as to whether it, it works out or not. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. If it's in the now, he does great. If it involves time management, planning, activating on something earlier, 
then he struggles. And that's the ADHD part of it. So in order then, that's kind of the, the theory, the background to understand how ADHD impacts the sense of time, the ability to manage time. We're now going to shift a little bit into the, okay, that's great. Now, what do I do with it? Like, how do I make my life, my kid's life, my students, my client's life, how do we make people's lives better with this? And to do that, we're going to talk about two different things. One is how to help folks with ADHD see time more effectively. And then we're going to also talk about how to help folks with ADHD feel time more effectively. And on the one hand, if I, I could easily strip ADHD out of all my slides and just give this as a general time management presentation, and it would apply to lots and lots of people. So this is not entirely specific to ADHD. Folks with ADHD don't invent new time management problems that nobody else has, but it's definitely very, it applies more so more often to folks with ADHD compared to folks without ADHD. So I just sort of feel like I need to put that in there. But um, another way of sort of saying it is that all of us could potentially benefit from applying some of these strategies a little bit more consistently. So let's begin by helping folks with ADHD see time by externalizing it. So, you know, as I sort of said earlier in the presentation, because folks with ADHD don't have as strong of an internal clock, they're more dependent on an external clock. Um, although, frankly, most of us are, most of us do a lot better with external clocks. So, um, so one of the things that I often kind of recommend is to clients is lots of clocks, lots of alarms, reminders, whatever. So, um, and that means clocks that are easily seen, that are easily visible, not a thing where you gotta take out your phone, enter your passcode, press two buttons, and then see what the time is. But clocks up on the wall, direct line of sight, whatever, so that time is easy to see. But also, um, Old-fashioned analog clocks, you know, like the clocks that have the two hands that move, are often, especially for kids, but really also for adults, are much better because they're much more sort of tangible. Like you can see the hand moving. You can see, ooh, it's almost on the 12, right? Whereas digital clocks, where it's just the numbers written out, it's completely abstract. So, you know, 1059 doesn't really look super different from 11 o'clock, if you know what I mean. Like it doesn't sort of have that call to action, so to speak, that a sweeping analog clock hand might. But also, in addition to just generally having lots of clocks, also lots of alarms, lots of reminders, lots of stuff that helps you recognize, ooh, it is now this time, or oh, now is, now is the time that I need to start transitioning to that other thing. Of course, just because you have clocks and just because you have reminders, that alone doesn't do the trick. You need to actually like look at them. And then when you look at them, you need to actually take into account what they say. So when the alarm goes off, that you actually do something with it. So just as like a silly example, long ago when I was running the Northern Virginia Chat Adult ADHD Support Group, um, there's a guy in, in the group who told this story that um, at night, he'd often get kind of lost in time on his computer and then he'd get to bed too late. So he set up a timer on his light. So they'd go off at like, I don't know, let's say 11 o'clock. And we're like, wow, that's really great. That's awesome. And he's like, yeah, but you know, then the problem is like, I'm really good at working in the dark, right? So it was like half of a solution. So, but at least at that point, he knows it's 11. So he can't say, I did not realize it was time to go to bed. He might still make a bad choice to stay up too late, but that's completely different than not being aware of it. And we'll talk a little bit more about this kind of towards the end. But at least you need to begin by knowing what time it is. So I have a saying that um, I'll sort of say this with clients that it's hard to do the right thing at the right time if you don't know first what time it actually is, but also what are you supposed to be doing now? You know, like, am I on track? Am I being productive? Am I making good use of the time? I don't know. What time is it and what should I be doing? Because, you know, time management is tasks in relation to time. So you got to know both things. What's the task and 
what's the time? So unfortunately for many of, uh, of our family and friends, um, a functional schedule system, meaning not perfect, but good enough, it really is kind of a prerequisite for a less chaotic life. I'm definitely not going to put a moral judgment on it. You can live your life any way you want to. But if you want your life to be less chaotic, you kind of got to have some sort of a schedule system, something that pretty much works like sort of most of the time. So again, not 100%, unless I set in a bar we can't reach, but something that helps you manage time more effectively. Or as I sometimes say, if you can remember inside your head everything you have going on in your life, it means you don't have enough going on in your life. Like your life should not be so small and boring that you can remember in your head everything that you got to do. Now, related to this is sort of the difference between schedules and to-do lists. So they're both important. They're both helpful. They both do, you know, important jobs in, in our lives, especially as we head into those adolescent years and then definitely into adulthood. Um, so one of the ways that I sort of think about the difference between schedules and to-do lists is that Schedules are for time-specific tasks. So in other words, I had to get onto this webinar at 2 o'clock. Um, or it could be I have a meeting at this time, I have an appointment, or whatever. So it's something that happens at a specific time. Whereas to-do lists, technically speaking, are much more about time non-specific tasks. So like I have to email Roberto about you know, conference proposals. Well, do I, what, when do I meet? Today? Now? in an hour, in a minute, next week, next year? Like, wh when is that supposed to happen? Maybe it matters, maybe it doesn't, but to-do lists are really for things that may or may not have a deadline, but they don't have to be done at a specific time. So one of the things then that I recommend is that people take to-do list items and put it into their schedule. And the reason is things that are given a specific time are more likely to happen. Conversely, things that sit on a to-do list can sit there forever because it's sort of one of those things of like, um, is now the time to do that? I don't know. How about now? Right? So an hour goes by, a day, a week, a year, and it's never gotten off the to-do list. Now, maybe it's because it was never really that important. It just never made the cut. But I don't know. Maybe it's because it was never given an actual time that something was supposed to happen. So to make it more likely to happen, I'll sometimes recommend that people take these to-do list items and make them time specific by putting them into the schedule. So let's see, I can work on that thing Thursday at two, I can work on it on Friday morning, I can work on it on Saturday, could be any of these times. Um, Friday morning it is, bam, I'll stick it in. Um, this is especially helpful if there's some sort of time constraint. So like, I got to call that guy back. All right, well, you know, this is like a business thing. So it has to happen during business hours. I'm not going to say Thursday night to make that phone call unless I can just leave a message. So what's a good time on Friday where he's going to be available, where it's likely that I'm going to get to it. Now, putting it into your schedule doesn't mean that you have to feel kind of constrained and locked in. And I think a lot of people who don't like to plan, they don't want to get stuck in it. Um, you can move it around. If Friday morning something else comes up, I can move that phone call. But at least it has a place to begin with. But also what it does is, especially for our folks with ADHD who kind of overschedule themselves, is as you begin to put stuff into the schedule and block time out, that's going to take 10 minutes, that's going to take an hour, that's going to be three hours, you can see your schedule start to fill up. And it, it then becomes easier to recognize once you're hitting that limit and to not take on more than you can do. This then brings us to sort of the, the home stretch here, where we talk about feeling time by maximizing motivation. So you got to know what time it is. You got to know what it is that you're supposed to be doing, have something of a decent plan to begin with. But just because you know it doesn't mean that you do it. And that's what we're going to talk about now. So. My unofficial slogan of ADHD time management, this is not always true, but it's like, like too often true is, by the time you feel it, it's too late. So Thursday night when you're 
feeling the pressure of the test, it's too late. Either it's too late to actually really prepare well, or it's too late to prepare well and also get a decent night's sleep. So there's some other price paid. Um, and if it's something like, I bought the concert tickets too late, or I bought airfare too late, or I paid that bill too late, sometimes the price paid is literally like in dollars. Like you pay a price in dollars of like, oh, got to do overnight shipping. Or all the $200 tickets are gone, I got to buy the $400 airfare because it's like three weeks away. So, um, so let's talk then about how to help folks with ADHD and maybe everybody kind of feel time earlier, feel the deadline, feel the pressure earlier when there's a, when it's a better time to work on it. Unfortunately, the problem with life is that as much as natural consequences can be great motivators, um, temporal discounting kind of kills those natural consequences. So, you know, the natural consequence, if, if the thing is, oh, we need to buy, you know, airfare, um, the natural consequence of those $200 tickets are gonna cost me 400. By the time I'm feeling that extra 200 bucks, it's too late. Like, you know, the die has been cast for this plane trip. Now, maybe I'll learn it next time. Maybe I'll sort of apply that and go, oh, got to get on that airfare a little bit earlier. But for our friends with ADHD, they don't feel it the next time as soon as they should, even if they got burned on 10 tickets before this. So in order to feel those natural consequences, those future natural consequences, at a time that we can actually like do something about it, um, what we need to do is apply forward past experiences and recreate that feeling. So in other words, if I'm sitting here and I'm watching TV, oh God, the last thing I want to do is get onto Expedia or Delta.com or whatever and start like looking for ticket options and what I like, I'm just done. Like, I don't want to deal with that. But if I think about it, I'm like, all right, well, let's think about what happened last time. I had to spend more money and the times really sort of sucked and I had a layover somewhere I didn't want. Like, uh, okay, I really hated that. I was really mad at myself when I took too long. So I don't want to feel that way again. If I don't do this now, I, I might put myself into that position of feeling that again. So uh, fine, okay, okay, let's you know, grab the laptop, let's turn off the TV, let's start looking. Um, because folks with ADHD have a harder time bringing that hindsight into the moment or that forethought of thinking about like, well, wait a second, we're looking at that trip kind of over the holidays, definitely a lot more people competing for tickets, really should get, get on that earlier than like some random Tuesday in the middle of the year. So, you know, not pausing long enough to consider the past, not pausing long enough to consider the future. So some ways then to feel the future now is, or as I sometimes say, to bring the future into the present is by making those consequences more immediate. So, you know, if we tell our kids, okay, if, you, if we tell our kids like, here's the deal, you can't play Xbox or whatever until you do your homework, that's definitely more immediate. As opposed to if we say, if you don't get your grade up before the weekend, now is Monday, you can't go out this weekend, you know, like much less immediate, much less likely to be effective. A lot of ADHD management involves making stuff more immediate, making it more frequent. So every day we're going to do this homework check, um, making it more external. So not just simply, boy, doesn't it really feel good? Doesn't it give you a warm glow to know that your homework is all completed, but make it, which is an internal motivation instead to make it a bit more external, which is look, once your homework is done, we'll play some ping pong. It'll be great. Make it more salient, meaning something you that the person actually cares about, that they care about, not you. So you may care about grades and totally understand why it matters. But your surly 13-year-old may not get it. Like, they don't get it. They don't see it. They don't feel it. You're just Charlie Brown's teacher, blah, 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 right? So find a way that matters to them. And then finally, 
be as consistent as you can. You don't have to be 100%, but as consistent as you can, because what happens is we talk ourselves into believing, well, maybe it won't work out. Maybe the teacher won't check it today. Maybe mom won't actually look to see if I did my homework until after I've already left to go to the movies, right? So like it, the less consistent it is, the more likely we are to kind of like roll the dice and hope for the best. We talked about folks with ADHD struggling with um, that response inhibition. Now, the counter to that, which is super easy to say, and I acknowledge it's definitely harder to do, but I still think it's, it's worth saying, it's worth aspiring to, it's worth practicing, is this idea of pause and picture. And the way that we compensate for temporal discounting is by really making a point, if it's ourself, we do this in our head. If it's our kid, maybe our partner, um, we, do, we can help them do this by sort of verbalizing and pointing it out, kind of walking them through this. But to pause and visualize how will I feel in the future based on what I do or don't, now, don't do now. So if I'm sitting there on Monday and thinking, I've got this homework, this big test on Friday, Kind of like, um, yeah, who cares? I, you know, whatever. It, it's, it's fine. I'll, I'll sort of figure it out later, right? Not really thinking about it. But if I do this myself or perhaps I'm coached to do it, um, think about like, okay, let's think about what Thursday looks like. Let's think about how do you feel all day in school on Thursday? Let's talk about what Thursday night looks like. What is that experience like for you when you have to cram for a test? Um, let's think about what Friday feels like when you've stayed up too late and you've slogged it out studying Thursday night. Let's think about what the rest of Friday feels like because now you're sleep deprived. Let's think about what it feels like when the teacher says, all right, your tests are coming back. Like, what's that feeling in your gut that happens when you hear those words? Um, and to really picture it as vividly as possible, not in some abstract thing of like, good grades are good. I want a good grade. But to think specifically, like, how will I feel in that situation? And to really sort of compare and contrast acting or not acting. Or another way of putting it is, how will future you feel about present you? And I'll sometimes do this a little bit as a joke, but to, you know, to say, especially like to a teenager, to say, you know, the problem is, like, here we are Monday you. Thursday you is going to be freaking pissed. He's going to be totally cursing you out and saying, like, that bastard Monday me, he totally set me up. He's totally screwed me on this one. If he had done something, I'd be in such a better place here on Thursday. Right? And I'll sort of like overplay it and sort of ham it up a bit to sort of drive home the ridiculousness of it. But I think it, it gets their attention. And I think it maybe makes it a little bit more kind of tangible for them. That this is not about me. It's not about the teacher. It's not about their parents. It's about how will they feel in that situation. So the more you can bring the present in, or the future into the present, the more likely you're going to be to be motivated into actual action. Now, in all of this, we're talking about time management as there's sort of like the cognitive skills, sensing time, planning, prioritizing. Um, and those are sort of psychologists call them like cold skills. Um, but then there's also like hot skills. So like cold is, this is like an artificial distinction, but cold is the intellectual skills and hot is the emotional one. So there's the hot motivation to actually use those skills. So, um, you know, just as one example, if the alarm goes off and says, all right, time to go, if you want to get that appointment on time, now's the time to get up, you may then... At that point, you know that it's time to go, but you may still choose not to do it. Um, so like, you know, my, the guy in my support group who, you know, had the, all the lights go off, definitely hard to miss. And yet he would make a choice sometimes to continue on whatever he was doing. Like technically speaking at that point, that's not really a time management problem. That's like a decision problem that, you know, but again, at least then he made a conscious choice. And at least then he had a shot at making a better choice. So sense of time then creates awareness. And without awareness, nothing else happens. Um, but then we need the motivation to act on that information. And we need to sort of feel the future in order to have that motivation. 
So sometimes then, especially if we're talking about kids and teens, and especially if we're talking about getting them to do stuff they don't really feel like doing, some, some of our challenge then is to help them see the benefit to them personally. And sometimes, I mean, a lot of parenting is, yeah, I know, but you just got to take my word for it. Or, no, you're not eating all candy for dinner. You definitely are going to get a vegetable in. And that's just the way it is. So, like, you know, families are not democracies. Classrooms are not democracies. But to the extent that we can connect it to something that's important to them, they're definitely going to be more motivated to try to do it. 